And hello, everyone. Welcome to our Ask the Expert event. Today, we will be learning about stamp collecting. I'm really looking forward to it. And we're going to be joined by expert Joseph Mullen on stamp collecting. I'm Brian O'Donovan. I'm a host of the Celtic Sojourn here on WGBH. Thanks to everybody who joined us for today's event. Uh, and we've got many people joining us for today's event. We'll talk about those numbers a little later on as well, but I'd like to also make a specific uh, welcome for our leadership circle and RLS members. Of course, your continued support of GBH makes events like this and so much more possible. Before we get started though, I'd like to introduce uh, some of the team behind the event. They will be pulling the strings, uh, keeping everything on the straight and narrow, connecting with you, but you will not see uh, or hear them much during the event itself, but right now, it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Bailey. Bailey is our event producer for this afternoon. Hi, Bailey. Hi, Brian. Thank you so much for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. We're very excited for our stamp collecting event. Um, just a quick reminder, we will not be able to hear or see you, but you will be able to hear and see our host and our expert. Um, back to you, Brian. Thanks, Bailey. Joining us from her home in Orlando and Florida, proving that we certainly are a work from home, a remote uh, organization these days more and more. Ileana from Orlando, welcome to uh, this gathering this afternoon. Thank you so much. Love that warm welcome. Hi, I'm Ileana and I'll be hanging out in the Q&A tab. We want to hear all your questions and you can do so by clicking the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Be sure to let us know where you're tuning in from before you submit your question. And then if you see a question you want to hear the answer to, you can move it up in the Q&A tab by giving it a thumbs up. Thank you so much and we really appreciate it. We hope you enjoy the event. Back to you, Brian. Thanks, Eliana. There's also a, a cool feature that I only learned about yesterday on Zoom that you can click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. So that means that two transcript display options will pop up. Now, we recommend that you choose subtitle here to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also choose full transcript and you will get just that on a sidebar window, uh, but you will get the full details of what each speaker is saying. But we do suggest subtitle might be a little bit better. Please bear in mind though, that closed captioning is a little bit delayed as the system processes essentially your, uh, uh, your speech and translating it into text. So right now we're going to get started, something that I'm really, really looking forward to. And we are joined on screen by Joseph Mullen, uh, who is the executive director of the Spellman Museum of Stamps and Postal History. One of only two museums, in fact, dedicated to postage stamps and postal history and mail in this country. Now in his role, he is responsible for the modernization of the nationally renowned Spellman. And we will talk about this extraordinary uh, institution a little bit more during our conversation, but he has also served in various leadership roles during his tenure, including vice chair of the board. Joseph was exposed to stamp collecting by his aunt, who was married to a letter carrier, and he inherited their collection of first day covers. Fascinating, and we'll talk more extensively on that as well, but his lifelong love of stamps was secured and inspired by that very special relationship with his aunt. He is a collection evaluator as well. So get those collections out. Uh, there might be some monetary value uh, to them. We will, we will pretend we're on Antiques Roadshow at some states this afternoon. But he also specializes in worldwide stamps from the years 1840 to 1940. Mr. Mullen was recently featured on the Nobel Spirit and H.E. Armour's Conversations with Philatelists podcast. There's a podcast for everything these days, and that one is really popular. He is considered one of the nation's leading philatelists. Now, in addition to his lifelong passion for stamps, he has deep expertise in the private sector in management consulting. He served as regional uh, director of a federal aviation regulatory agency within two presidential administrations and as docent at the International Museum of World War II in Natick, Massachusetts. He earned his bachelor's degree from Harvard University and his master's in public administration from George Washington University. Joseph Mullen, great to have you with us on GBH this afternoon. Well, thank you, Brian. Nice to be with you. And as we say at the Spelman Museum, stamps are for champs. 
Looking forward to talking to one and all. <laughs> that is a great line. Stamps are for champs. Absolutely. That's a bumper, bumper sticker. Can you buy a bumper sticker there that says stamps? You can. Champs? Yeah. I bet you we'll can. We have a huge number of people on here. I'm amazed, quite frankly, the, the number of people. Now, I'm, I'm hosting this, Joseph, and fully, fully, I am a, a complete Philistine when it comes to stamps or stamps collecting, which, 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 which means that I'm more fascinated than, than anybody that you uh, uh, can imagine. And I'm really excited about this. By the way, if I can say to the audiences, uh, get ready for questions. There are questions coming in already. And you can open the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, type a question there. And if you see a question you want to hear answered, vote for it. That's another thing. So you mightn't have that question or it might have been asked. Previously, it's on that screen. You can vote for it. And the more votes we get, we'll move that question up to ask uh, uh, Joseph. But you know, a huge number of people on here, over almost 400 people. Now, I'm a newbie, but I've been fascinated with stamp collecting. and. Philately. Am I saying that correct? Philately? Philately? Philately. And yes, I am a philatelist and, and uh, philately is the correct, the correct pronunciation. Now, there is a difference, though. I, I conflate those two terms, stamp collecting and philately. They're not necessarily the same thing. Is that correct? Well, if philately is the overriding, the overriding identity that we would have with any aspect of postal history, mm -hmm or with the stamps themselves. So yes, it's a, uh, it's a general term, uh, but uh, we don't uh, have any ears about us. We accept the use of those two terms as if they're synonyms. So uh, it's, it's perfectly okay. You're doing so well. Tell us a little bit about the Spellman though. This is an institution I will admit that I was unaware of. And I think that's typical of a lot of uh, great institutions in New England. There are so many in this area that sometimes something can fly under the radar screen until it's pointed out to you. Tell us about the Spellman. Well, it's an extraordinary nonprofit uh, uh, museum that's on the campus of Regis College and was founded by an eminent Roman Catholic Cardinal Cardinal Francis uh, Spellman, a famous uh, with one, right? Of, uh, a you know, dedicated group of nuns from the congregation of the Sisters of St. Joseph, including one remarkable woman, Sister Fidelma. And jointly, they decided that our museum should be completely non sectarian and open to one and all. But it was the Cardinal's uh, collection that started us off in the year 1961. And we've been uh, growing and educating and collecting since then. And has it been, where, where, where physically is located? Regis College, is that? Is it's that at Regis there? College in the town, of, the town of Western Massachusetts. And we have uh, many of our members, I'm sure, are uh, actually uh, chiming in at, on this event. We, uh, we differentiate ourselves at the Smithsonian National Postal Museum a little bit uh, with, with extraordinary tribute to them. But mm -hmm. our focus is quite a, a worldwide focus so that we are uh, really always uh, aware of the uh, international aspect uh, in that regard, by the way, it, uh, uh, be, uh, it, it's a, a good opportune time to mention that the Cardinal Spellman Philatelic Museum, the Postal Museum is gonna be the world headquarters for the next international show that's gonna be held in the United States. And that show is going to be the Boston International Show in the year 2026 and the Spelling Museum is going to be the official headquarters for that show. So we have a worldwide reach. We're, we're real proud of that. And you should be real proud of that as well. It's, it's out there, Regis College. If you're ever traveling on Route 20, you see the signs for Regis College. Uh, and. Uh, it is, it is accessible there. Of course, now just, just to talk, stay with the Spellman for a second. Because of COVID, it is not open to the public in a general way, right? It, in a general way, it's still not open to the public. We are a museum and we're under uh, phase two of, of the governor of Massachusetts requirements. And we're uh, really seeking to comply with those requirements as we go along. Uh, but we are open for appointments. Hmm. We have our staff coming in. <clears throat> we uh, have... Uh, many people coming in to have their uh, collections evaluated, no matter how large or how small. The evaluation and the, uh, and the discussion that we have has a small fee of $50 to it, no matter how small or large your collection is. And the other element is we're open to receive donations from individuals who are uh, uh, winnowing down their, their, uh, their homes and their collections, and they want to somehow find a legacy or a, uh, a good home for their collections were opened by appointment for donations as well. 
Well, it sounds like an ideal place to visit and something that everybody should know who's interested in stamp collecting or philately. Uh, you can access it, of course, just by searching Spellman stamps or Spellman Museum. Um, it's, it'll pop right at you at the first Google search that you have. We have tons of questions, Joseph. So I know we're going to run out of time at the other end of it, and I'm going to jump right into it here. Susie M says, I inherited an old stamp collection and would like to know where to get it appraised. I think you might have just answered that question, where to sell it and if I want to do that. But but just re-answer that as briefly as you can. Surely. The idea of donating the collection, as I say, if it's already been appraised or evaluated by the owner, but the donor is to forward it to us or uh, uh, drop it off at 241 Wellesley Street in Western Mass, 02493. Uh, in terms of having a consultation, as this question I may be interested in, uh, that can be uh, uh, arranged anytime uh, by appointment only uh, by going on to our webpage and uh, emailing to, to me. Uh, my email is josephwmullen at gmail.com. And we set up uh, these consultations, no matter how large or small your collection might be. Now, there is one title or one word that the, uh, the caller is using that does require a bit of differentiation. And that is our consultations or evaluations are really not a replacement for what we would call uh, appraisals, appraisals of the explicit mm -hmm. value of an in-depth collection that might be of higher value. Mm -hmm. We do consult as to whether a collection is in that higher value category, gotcha. but we do not provide the internal revenue service forms for that appraisal. And I, if you have a, a collection that's above $5,000, you should get that IRS and we would give you a list of who those appraisers are. But you're a great place to start, it sounds, for all of this. And Carter Elliott is writing the same question, essentially, how do I find a qualified appraiser in my community? And I assume there are such people. But starting with you would give people a lot of information on this whole process. There are. There are appraisers. We're, in, of course, in the Boston area, and we uh, know uh, two or three appraisers mm -hmm. uh, locally within the uh, metropolitan area whom we refer. And we refer uh, people to these appraisers because we're aware of their integrity, their transparency, uh, yeah. their accuracy. Uh, uh, but having said that, to the extent that callers are in other metropolitan areas, uh, that uh, they can simply go online punch in the word uh, on Google for uh, stamp appraisals. And, you, and in almost every major city, there'll be two or three individuals who do what I'm talking about. Gotcha, yeah, so a next, a next listener who's, a, who's anonymous just comes up with a number, but say, asks about doing some research on current stamp values and talks about Lim, Lin's and Scott's catalog and also eBay, of course, primarily UN and US mint sheets. The, uh, the uh, viewer or the listener writes. Um, but again, all of that is there with, with simple searches. You're saying there's, there's a lot of information on the net that one can find. There is, by the way, Brian, I, I uh, encourage individuals who are listening in who may not be, uh, they may have inherited the collection. It might be somebody who is trans, the collection has mm. been transferred to him or her, that we'd love to meet new people. I, uh, we're, we're, we're friendly philatelists. There you are, we're friendly philatelists and we would encourage people to come on by and there's, uh, there's another we'll have tea and coffee for you if you show there's up. There's another and, and yeah, absolutely. And the uh, friendly philatelists. There's another bumper sticker somewhere in there, Joseph. There think, is. So. What's the best way, Susie M asks, uh, what's the best way to store stamps? Is there, I'm sure there's consideration around humidity, around temperature, around all of that type of thing. What's the best way to store stamps? Best way to store, th store collections is, uh, first of all, uh, to avoid heated or hot attics or cold attics, and especially the four-letter word that we use in basements called mold, a damp mm. basement. Uh, the idea is to have it in a uh, a room without too much heat, too much uh, cold temperature, with albums that are really standing upright, uh, and uh, in uh, in bookcases, uh, and leave them there, and then they'll be they'll be kept just fine. Here's an interesting one that may raise a little bit of a topic. It's from Lawrence Reich. He says he was a collector since he was a child, seventy years ago. 
And uh, so he has a lot of experience in this. Having put away my collection for 20 years, dismayed he is now at what at where Philately is going. His mint 1930s 3C stamps are worth 3C now. I'm, I'm not sure what that means, three, three cents. In bulk, $1,000 face value in mint US stamps may be worth $600. I, I'm wondering, is he saying that there is a decrease in value of stamps? And what is the future of stamp collecting is his specific que question. I assume I think, around values because he's- I think what he's specific. asking is the, um, is the value of stamps that might have been purchased mint in the 30s or 40s or 50s and 60s. Yeah. And whether or not they have appreciated in value over the years and the decades. And that's a actually a, a pivotal question and an excellent question, B. Mm. In essence, in the year around 1925, the uh, Bureau of Printing and Engraving in the United States and in other countries around the world changed its uh, the degree to which they were printing each stamp that came out. So prior to 1925 or so, stamps would be printed in uh, volumes or values of let's say 50,000 or $100,000, picking numbers out of a hat uh, for each stamp that was issued. But after that time, it was an exponential increase mm. around the world really in, in the number of stamps being printed for each new issue. And again, to pull a number out of my hat. So rather than let's say 50,000 or 100,000, of, or even a million. After that, you might have had a billion of each stamp being printed beginning right. in, in that early year. So that stamps who that have issued for three cents in 1935 or 45 or 55 do not have much of an appreciation beyond the three cents because the I, supply of those stamps never goes down. It's, it's, it's simply supply and demand. Of course, as an outsider, you often talk about the, the very, very rare stamps that, that acquire value. And they do because of the rareness, I assume. It's a, it's a similar dynamic as, as anything that's out there. It's a supply and demand issue. Well, that's right. As a matter of fact, it gives me a chance to do a tiny bit of show and tell. Yeah, rather, uh, this is somebody's a stamp that I think many, many American collectors will be will be familiar with. And this is the C3A upside down email. Which now, is a mistake, mistake, I assume, right? Uh, it's a mistake that that plane is flying upside down. And to encourage anyone who's, uh, who's writing in, there were 100 stamps of those issued. Uh, because of the mistake, the market value of that, that rarity today of the 100 is approximately 400 to 425,000 each. Whoa. Now, to that, Brian, I might add that a total of three of them are outstanding. And that is, we do not know where they are, and they may be in somebody's attic or in somebody's bookcase. And the final point I'll make is that one, there were four of them up until about three or four years ago. A woman lost her stamp, her C3A in Norfolk, Virginia, and it showed up where else but Dublin Island. And the collector in Dublin mercifully realized what he had, and he got it back to the lady from Norfolk, Virginia. Whoa, that is a great story. I thought you were going to say it was owned by the widow of the pilot who was flying the plane upside down, but that's not yeah, the case. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a pretty good <laughs> way of looking at it, yes. I hope, uh, I hope this is a technical question that you can sort out because it wouldn't make sense to me to be asked. Uh, what is the best way to separate a stammo from a high bed back in the stamp book. Does that make sense or is it, a, is it a series of typos or is it a drunk test that might be administered on 128? I don't know. It sounds like Guinness started noon okay. to me. Okay. No. So is, is this a good time to sell stamp collections right now? Where is the marketplace as it, as it looks? The, as a matter of fact, in, uh, in terms of the long-term values of stamps, even those that have some value. We've been on a, a decline since a pinnacle year of 1989 or so. Really? Uh, so that those rarities have had some decrease in value uh, as time has gone up until the present year, up until it would be really the beginning of, of 2020 uh, with all of the misfortune that's affected everybody. Uh, in essence, there have been some uh, lemonade being made out of some of the lemons and that is occurring in the stamp, uh, the stamp field. Values are up. Bids are up. Uh, we do a lot of business in our, uh, our museum with our duplicates with a company called Noble Spirit out of Pittsfield, New Hampshire. And they do a lot of internet uh, 
selling on behalf of uh, dealers and, and collectors all over the world. The bids they're receiving and the prices that are realized are higher by far than they've been. So this is an excellent time to be to either begin to sell your collection or to donate it to the Spellman. This is a very interesting question and a practical one from Ivantea Vlachis. What is the best way to remove a stamp from an envelope or other backing? Is there a particular way that you recommend, I assume, to preserve the value of that stamp and, and, uh, and to avoid any damage to it? Yeah, the, the, uh, you, you, again, a good question, especially for collectors who are beginning. They're young boys and girls, and they have stamps on envelopes, or what we call stamps on paper. And in essence, you can simply get a bowl of water that's neither too hot or not too cold, room temperature, uh, put the stamp uh, into the, uh, into the uh, water, wait approximately 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes, and much of the time, the uh, stamp, uh, the paper stamp will, will float off from one another. Mm. Uh, a portion of the time, one can take a set of tweezers and gently remove the stamp from the paper, but that's, that's the best way to do it. Lisa Levina, who's a one-time ex-colleague of ours, I believe. Uh, hi, Lisa, good to have you with us this afternoon. It's been a while, she says, since she's added to her collection. Can you talk about how people put, and she puts it in quotes, sticker stamps into their collection? Uh, well, they can put sticker stamps into their collection by the uh, uh, use of mounts. They can use, use a mount in order to protect the back. What she's talking about is that if the, the self-adhesive stamp is put into the album, mm -hmm. then it's going to stick and, uh, uh, and not... Uh, the idea is to keep the adhesive on the back of the, of, the, uh, of the sheet when you buy it and somehow put it into a, a mount so that you're not exposing that adhesive. What the, the caller is thinking about is the adhesive will stick to whatever surface you put it on. But if you keep it on the surface on which you bought it at the post office, then you have to do the best you can in finding a mount for that and putting it into your album that way. We are talking with Joseph Mullen of the Spellman Museum of Palatley, which is located in Regis College. You should definitely visit it. Where is the other stamp museum in the US? I think you talked about this a little bit. Teresa wants to know the answer to that question, but could you repeat it there? You said you're one of two, where is the other? The other is the National Postal Museum of the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. And uh, they uh, I commend everyone, whoever is in the DC area uh, to visit that museum. It's the most extensive collection of United States stamps uh, anywhere in the world. And they also have a, a quite a bit of orientation on the mailman, that mail mm. carrier, and the history of uh, mail delivery in the United States. And I, uh, I have to say that uh, the United States Post Office deserves a, a lot of credit. Not only did I get inspired by my Uncle Charles McCarthy delivering mail in, in the city of Somerville, but I became a mail carrier myself for a couple of years working really? for the House of Representatives Post Office down in Washington, D.C., and delivering mail to Congress people between 4 a.m. and 9 a.m. in the morning. So that post office and the representation of it with the, uh, the uh, artifacts and the equipment of the post office is superbly well done. I need also, uh, Brian, to recommend a, another extraordinary organization in our country called the American Philatelic Society. And that group represents uh, really approximately 30,000 stamp collectors around the country in terms of really uh, stamp expertizing, library research services, uh, in addition, uh, uh, access to insurance plans, almost as a trade association for the collectors. So I commend them too, to any collectors who are getting into the intermediate category. Finally, there is a local museum in Tucson, Arizona, mm. that was emphasizing uh, the uh, postal history of the Pony Express. There are several small museums like that there's also a library at the Brown University and the New York uh, Public Library. They have extreme, extraordinary collections. So I need to pay credit to these other organizations that are out there as well. And Joseph, talking about that, you, you essentially stamps are one thing, the physical stamps themselves. But you're talking about the history of the Postal Service. You're talking about the history, of the real close tie-ins with the history of development of societies in this country, with the history of the development of communication generally. That's, that's certainly not lost in the Spellman, right? 
That's not lost at the Spelman at all. You come in and you see a mail carrier and we feature letters in our exhibits. As a matter of fact, one of the items at the Spelman that I should emphasize is that we are current every several months for our members in the public at large in the exhibits that we, we offer. Uh, currently, for instance, even though we're closed when we reopen probably in July, we have an extraordinary exhibit on uh, in honor of the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage the effort by suffragettes and women to get the vote 100 years ago, as well as the 400th anniversary of the uh, Mayflower coming to uh, Pilgr uh, Pilgrims coming to uh, Plymouth, Massachusetts. We have exhibits on the Civil War, North and South, uh, mm -hmm. the original camp, uh, Penny Black from Great Britain. And so just, yeah, those are the items as about. well that, uh, that uh, bring us bring our visitors to our to our building. John Winder says, can you comment on the relative collectability of first day covers and numbered print blocks, the set of four stamps on the corner uh, with the print plate number attached? I assume this is before the actual stamp is, is issued, something that's created to, to produce the stamps en masse. Can you comment that, on the relative collectability of those? Yes, it requires a certain amount of, uh, of prudent conversation uh, without uh, without uh, uh, going too far into the joy and the inspiration and the solitude solace that individual collectors experience in deciding what stamps to collect and what stamp what stamps not to collect. I was a first day cover collector for years and years when I began in the fifth grade in, in, in the middle 1950s, and the answer is is that uh, once again, if a first day cover or a plate block or a sheet of stamps it has a certain age to it, then there is appreciation in the value of each of those, each of those items. And once again, uh, it's a, a oversimplification, but the, the key age is around 1925. After that, there isn't really much differentiation between the value of the plate block, the four stamps with the plate number, or the first day cover with a picture on it, which we call the cachet, okay. and the postmark that says first day cover, and the value of uh, the stamp itself. Maybe a slight value increase in the marketplace, but other than that, it really doesn't. Uh, it doesn't go far beyond the value of the stamp in its original single form. What's well, really interesting there, you use the term cachet, of course, which is used in computing as well, which is something that has replaced to many uh, 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 folks uh, th that system of communication. Whereas before, we wrote letters. And the next question from Monica and Steve Neumann asks a specific question about this. How does the museum help young people particularly learn about stamp collecting and even about snail mail itself and how we can communicate best with others and looking at that system of communication from the original snail mail written with quills and sent by carrier pigeon originally all the ways to the instant messaging systems that exist today. Well, we have a children's program, which is extraordinary. And I'd have to say that one of the considerable strengths of our uh, constituencies and our support comes from uh, children. And children, uh, I would say, uh, in defining it a little bit more carefully, would be between anyone between the ages of four and five, and really 11 and 12, and uh, before you get into, into adolescence. We have a program that uh, allows children to sign up as members for uh, really a, a free admission charge uh, to come into the museum and to receive packets from our dedicated staff on a monthly basis so that the collector can go ahead, the, the boy or the girl can go ahead and, and receive some stamps and visit our stamps. When they do visit, we have a children's room that is dedicated to uh, to that group. Mm. And in that children's room, we have many, many children's books to read, as well as literally hundreds of stamps that are available for purchase by these children at the really exorbitant rate of two cents per stamp. Wow. And we find that a child comes in with a dollar or two dollars and leaves with a hundred stamps, or whatever it might be. Uh, and there's a, a lot of joy. In addition, I might add that we have a, for those of you who are uh, seeking to get into the hobby within our museum, we have a beginner's stamp collector's kit with a, an elementary album, a group of hinges, a group of stamps, a stamp tongue, and the investment value of that is approximately $20. Okay. Stamp kits, so we would love to get, if you were wondering about your boy or girl, $20, get them started. If the hobby takes, they can come back and continue. And if not, they've had a wonderful exposure to a beautiful hobby. 
Beverly Blatz uh, writes to us and asks uh, the question about a large collection of first day covers that she has in her position. Is there any value to these? I've tried to make some inquiries, but nobody seems interested, she says. I assume the answer is it depends on the first day covers, right? Well, I want to just answer that we have never met a stamp or a first day cover that we haven't loved with great passion and joy. So she can consider us in terms of, of uh, her destination for those first day covers. The, uh, and with okay. us, what happens is we uh, provide you with a receipt for the uh, donation that you receive, and you are able to go ahead and to uh, establish a value and receive a tax deduction or your donation to us. In the open marketplace, where you're seeking to find uh, dealers who might buy them, we can provide you with a list of who those dealers are. But I do have to say that she's onto a pivotal point and that the market for first day covers is really, again, not that much above the value of the single stamp by itself. Gotcha. So there's no value added and no appreciation that we would love to have. Uh, so it's, it's, there isn't, there's so much inventory that yeah. the dealers don't have much of an interest in, in many of those covers unless they're rare or pre-1925. Yeah, so managing expectations. You're, you're, you're philately therapists as well. As I am, else that's I really am. I'm a philately, I'm a, uh, what did I say? I'm a postal, postal history philately therapist. So come to me <laughs> with your stamp problems. David Silverman is, asks a key question. How can I donate to the Spellman? That's a good question for our audience this afternoon. Exactly. Uh, you can go online and you can go ahead and find our, our address. You can call me uh, on the, on the uh, central line, uh, Joe Mullen. Uh, love to talk about donations. We would establish the process and how it might work. Uh, many, many collectors from around the country have voluminous albums, many albums, and uh, we discuss how to send them by uh, different freight ways, uh, UPS or other ways, Federal Express to get them to us. Uh, smaller albums can be mailed to us within the Boston metropolitan area or, or um, Southern Maine or New Hampshire uh, and Rhode Island, they can be hand delivered. And um, that's the way to, uh, to, to consider donating uh, items to us is to have a consultation, phone or otherwise, and we'll begin the process from there. Well, that's brilliant to hear. And a lot of people interested out there in these types of activities are also interested in, in supporting efforts like uh, those going on at the Spellman. Uh, Barbara Dancer asks the question, are USA stamps generally more desirable than European stamps? Uh, USA stamps are very much more uh, desirable to the United States and to American collectors. That is, that is, that is, uh, that is uh, correct. And obviously, uh, the uh, uh, British would be uh, great. British people would be more interested in British stamps, French people in French stamps. The other item, which is a little bit subtler, is that the uh, stamp collecting uh, passion and uh, membership is uh, a bit stronger in Europe. And it's burgeoning in the uh, in the in the China, Southeast Asia, India oh. area. So the uh, it seems as if the hobby of stamp collecting is catching up uh, more quickly in the in these other areas. Yeah. Um, really so agree. so a lot of people coming onto it. A, a quick uh, a quick question for you before we we take a, a a quick break for some some housekeeping. What stamps would you like to see issued? It says here during Boston 2026. Is there something happening in Boston in 2026 that I don't know about or I should know about? There is, and I think I mentioned it, and uh, that is the uh, the world philatelic community gotcha. and the American philatelic it. community have yeah. arrived at a point where every 10 years, uh, it is uh, desirable to have an American city host really an international worldwide participation exposition and, uh, and show mm -hmm. in, 20, in 2006. That international show occurred in Washington, DC in 2016, it took place in New York City. And in 2026, this international community and American community have designated Boston and uh, really a very dedicated staff with uh, Nancy Clark, uh, APS person, very prestigious as the chairman, Dr. Emil Corey, uh, on the staff and Mark Rutterline as executive director. This staff is working very diligently right now to contact people and make them aware. The reservations have been made at the convention center. 
Uh, the plans are going forward and a good time will be had by all. <laughs> it certainly will be. I, I'm fascinated with this conversation. We've got lots to go. We've got tons of questions. I, I'm, I'm overwhelmed with the number of questions and the, and the fascination with this, this huge audience for our afternoon conversation uh, with Joseph Mullen of the Spellman Museum of Philately. Uh, it is great to have you all there. We're gonna to try to get as many questions as possible, continue the conversation, uh, but so many great questions out there. Thanks for that. And I would like to take a moment to introduce you to my colleague here, who is a wonderful colleague for many, many years, uh, and is going to, to tell you about some of her work here at GBH. Sandy Chin, fascinating conversation going on here, right? About, were you familiar with philately stamp collecting? It, no, it is such an amazing and fascinating Seriously. conversation. I feel that uh, I've learned a new spelling bee word too. <laughs> and exactly. um, um, so thank you so much, Brian. And thank you, Joseph. And thank you to you and our audience for spending some time with us while we ask our expert, Joseph Mullen, about all things stamps. I know I'm learning a lot today and I'm sure you are too at home. And that's why viewers and listeners turn to GBH, whether to learn more about stamp collecting or something new or to simply be entertained. And if you turn to GBH for news and entertainment, then please consider making a donation. You've heard the expression, April showers bring May flowers. Well, GBH has you covered with this black and white vented umbrella our thank you gift to you when you support GBH as a sustainer at $5 a month or $60 all at once. Visit gbh.org slash support events to make that donation or give in any amount that works for you. Every dollar helps GBH provide more free, free programs and events to our community. Or you can simply click on the support link in the chat tab now or text GBH to 800 492-1111 to make that donation. And just like an envelope without a stamp, we'd be lost without you. <laughs> Thanks again for joining us today. And now back to our conversation and back to you, Brian. That's Sandy Chin. Thank you, Sandy. And it reminds me, we often, all of us here who work at GBH are reminders, reminded often that we are simply keepers of a, of a public trust. Joseph, you're in that kind of position as well. And this really GBH is yours. So your support of it, your constant support of it leads to innovations even during a pandemic, like events like this one, which uh, we, that team that you're, you're seeing on screen has single-handedly developed since this uh, pandemic began. So it's terrific. It gets us to talk about stamp collecting. It's an ill wind that blows no good, they say in Ireland, Joseph, and we may not be talking about philately if it wasn't for this pandemic. So we'll take that as a positive, right? Joseph right. Mullen is with me from the Spellman Museum. We've got lots of questions. We're going to kind of go into speed questioning at this stage, Joseph. So, uh, Brian, if I might, I, I might make a comment. Sure. If, uh, strongly, strongly in support of WGBH and the Thank programming you. they do, and uh, all the way through the uh, the uh, newscast that they do, uh, are phenomenal. And I am a devotee. Uh, I also uh, would like to. Uh, take a little bit of a liberty to really express my appreciation to the individuals, the stamp collectors and enthusiasts and, and people who want to learn about stamp collecting. In fact, to show you how current this hobby is at the present time, Brian, I have a question for you, and that is, what do John Lennon of the Beatles, Ron Woods of the Rolling Stones, and Freddie Mercury of uh, will we rock you, Queen, have in common? Do you know the answer to that, Brian? Um, I'm thinking it's related to Philately, so I'll say either they have or they have not been issued stamps. They are stamp collectors. Themselves, really? Themselves. So this is this is a this is an exciting. Well, where, where in the case, unfortunately, in the case of two of them, right? Did you say Freddie Mercury and John John Lennon? Yes, and uh, Freddie Mercury's collection was sold on the open market, but John Lennon's collection is uh, held in one of the museums in, in Great Britain at this time. So it, uh, it has been protected and is uh, a tribute to him. Imagine. Uh, but the, imagine. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, I like that. So uh, the other point I wanted to make is that uh, in terms of our <clears throat> exhibits, we really have what's called topical collecting, and I need to encourage anyone out there to choose your, your topic 
uh, and it can be something as simple as trains, but it can be it can be something as exotic as shellfish. And to show you what I've learned in the last uh, few days, I had a visit from uh, Christina Joyce of uh, nearby Concord, and she specialized in conchology and malacology. Ooh. Those are shells on stamps. And uh, I learned something that day. And then I got contacted by Darlene Olaf in New York City, and she's uh, concentrated on sheep on stamps. So we have been the beneficiary in receiving both those shells on stamps and sheep on stamps topics of collecting. And we, uh, there is no topic that we, uh, we don't love to receive. It's a wonderful world, definitely. Becky from Brookline is saying, uh, can you tell me about the cancellation of stamps and the placement of that cancellation? Does it matter for collectors where that cancellation stamp is placed? The cancellation is the item that really shows that the stamp on an envelope has been used and put through the mail and therefore cannot be reused. And the question is a good one. And that normally in the United States, the stamp is put on the upper right hand corner. But the key element or uh, subtlety is that, well, how does the cancellation get placed on the envelope? And we call that obliteration sometime when the, mm -hmm. uh, the cancellation actually cancels out or really hides the, uh, the stamp itself. So that's the way we hope that the post office does it, is to put it on so that it is clear, but it also indicates that the stamp has been used. Gotcha. Mary Lenore uh, Kessler uh, asked a question about storing stamps. We answered that a little earlier, but she asks a general question, which is better, cancel stamps or those never used? In the modern sense, most of the time, it is the used, the unused or mint stamp that is the more valuable. On the other hand, in sometimes uh, situations where fewer stamps are issued by a country, mm -hmm. or the stamp is older, or uh, it's, it's uh, issued by either a province or a state within a country, such as the German provinces or Italian provinces, where uh, stamps were not many stamps are issued, and therefore not used. Sometimes it is the used stamp in those situations that is more valuable than the mint. But as a general rule, the mint stamp is much more valuable than the used. We're going to speed this up, uh, Joseph, if that's okay with you. If you can believe no. it, we have 84 open questions right now. We're clearly not going to get to all of them, but we're going to try to get to um, uh, as many as possible. And I'm going to uh, kind of editorialize some of them. Uh, Sue is asking if the, she's got old stamps uh, uh, is it worth getting them appraised? And I assume the answer is you, you just don't know until you see them, right? Uh, it's worth getting them appraised, but you, one can go to a local stamp dealer if you're not in, in the New England area mm -hmm. and have him or her do an evaluation as to whether they should be appraised. Normally, the Internal Revenue Service uses a guideline of $5,000 of value in which to really pay attention to appraisals as opposed to evaluations. That's really interesting. Barbara's asking again, what's the best online stamp auction website? Well, the one that we like is up at uh, Noble Spirit in terms of that uh, online auction. It's a worldwide uh, internet uh, stamp company that uh, uh, deals in stamps and covers. And the other value in terms of collectors who have first day covers or plate blocks is that uh, Noble Spirit really integrates and will accept any, any uh, degree of stamps, no matter how inexpensive or how rare they might happen to be with their worldwide reach. Interesting question from Susan Webster asks if the postal stamping itself is of value or is it just the stamp itself? The postal, you know, the postal stamp that goes on it, it was canceled or, or, or does that have a well, value? She's raising a good point and that is what we call that stamps on cover. And the answer mm -hmm. is that if you have the stamp on the envelope, it is almost always in every case advisable to keep the envelope, the stamp on the envelope and not take it off. And that's called stamps on cover. And in those cases for many of the stamps that are older, the stamp that is on the cover on the envelope that is intact and in good condition is significantly more valuable than the stamp by itself. Gotcha. That's really interesting. John Winder, 50 years ago, he says he's a stamp collector from way back. Countries like Monaco or San Marino were making odd shaped stamps, beautiful stamps, like triangles. Is this still happening in some countries? And are these kinds of stamps from this period of any particular value, I suppose, because of that shape? 
more and more countries are uh, reflecting on the early triangles, the diamonds uh, that were printed by certain uh, certain countries. Cape, uh, the Cape of Good Hope issued issued stamps in, with with triumphs that are very very popular and desirable. But in the United States, we've begun to do some of that selectively to have diamonds and have triangles ourselves. And a variety of other countries are doing the same thing. So the answer is once again the differentiation between the old and the new. Uh, yes, it's becoming uh, popular to have triangle stamps and odd shaped stamps, but once again, the value is more or less in the age of the stamp in that triangle rather than, than, uh, than the, the shape itself. Gotcha. Janet Wilder is asking that uh, the stamp collecting books when she was a kid had a picture of every stamp, but now there are so many, no album could possibly hold them all. And is there a kind of a new and innovative way to store them and display stamps these days, just given the sheer volume? Really, the key uh, point is the degree to which one wants to uh, be a worldwide collector. And it, the point is really well made that to be a well worldwide collector these days with the United States alone issuing 100, 150 stamps by itself is impossible to keep up with. But one can try. <clears throat> if one decides to try that, Scott International uh, uh, issues each year the albums that reflect the growth in the hobby in a worldwide and I think they have approximately 50 albums that you would have to buy to keep up uh, with those with that uh, range of worldwide collecting if you only did what I do and that's 1840 to 1940 then you only need four of those Scott International albums and that's all you need but she's making a good point it's almost impossible to do worldwide therefore one should specialize. Ted Kuklinski is asking a question, how many, and I'm interested in the answer to this myself, how many new US stamp designs come out each year? I think I answered it with a vague knowledge that it's around 100 to 125. Really? And one of your listeners may have the exact figure, but I think that that's, that's what's issued each year by the United States. It's, it's, it's a lot of stamps. Roger Barnaby is joining us from Newburyport, Massachusetts, uh, and he has an extensive collection of US mint commemoratives, individual more than 100 mint sheets. And he has heard, uh, to verify or deny this, uh, Joseph, if you will, he's heard that you in part to the passing of World War II vets, who apparently were avid collectors after the war, that the existing market is somewhat flooded and values have plummeted. Full sheets are now essentially valued at face value with exceptions, of course. Uh, how would you comment on that? Uh, I think he, I'm not sure I, I disagree with what he said. I think what he said is that since World War II, if you bought sheets of stamps, they haven't gone up in value. I think that's what he said. If that's what he was saying, he, that's an accurate statement. They, they haven't gotten up in value. And in fact, some of the sheets from the 1950s, beautiful, wonderful stamps, would be uh, only sold to various uh, dealers who need them in inventory at a fraction, let's say 30, 40, 50, 60% of their face value. Mm. I think that's what the caller or the writer is, is, is asking about. Uh, Pat is asking on behalf of many folks on this Zoom call and this Zoom webinar, do you have to bring the stamps to you for evaluation? Do you have to bring them there physically or is it something that can be done like we're doing right now on Zoom or some sort of PDF imagery? Can that be done? Uh, some of the imagery that one might have in terms of uh, the classical period, 1840 to 1940, um, are, uh, can be analyzed with, uh, with photos or uh, documents that are sent uh, to, uh, to us to look at. And uh, you can do an evaluation or, or a, a discussion, consultation mm -hmm. on that basis. But to do an actual appraisal, one needs to see the gum in the back of the stamp, the condition of the stamp live, gotcha. uh, and, and the color of the stamp in order to make a, an, an actual value uh, assessment of what the stamp is worth. So anything like fine art, it needs to be looked at physically, at least in the final analysis. Ian Drummond asks an interesting question. How common are stamp forgeries? As a kid, Ian writes that he obtained an old stamp album from about 1893. He treasured it when he soaked some of the stamps, however, the ink just dissolved. And he wondered forever, were these likely forgeries? Is that a common thing in stamps? 
Well, he's asking two questions, and that is the, uh, I'll go to the forgery first. There are forgers out there really from the first stamp in 1840, the Penny Black issued by Great Britain. Um, from that day on, there were individuals who decided to see if they could counterfeit these stamps. Mm. And what really happened was that stamp issuing authorities all over the world invented something called watermarks. And so most of the stamp issuing entities of the world put in a hidden insignia or symbol within the this paper itself by which mm. they print the stamps. Even there, some of these forgeries are trying to uh, fool people by imitating some of those watermarks or the design of the stamp itself. So yes, it is a common, common problem, which is why what many people have to do with the rarest of stamps is to get it expertized, authenticated. I mentioned the American Philatelic Society in, in Pennsylvania, and that group is, is wonderful in terms of doing evaluations and expertizing. They charge you a modest fee, and it's good to get a certificate if you have a stamp that is a high value, let's say $500 or higher. I see an authentication cer certificate of some description. What is your personal, Marianne Vetterling asks, what is your personal favorite exhibit at the museum? Uh, Joseph, and when do you think it might be open again? Are you looking at the state regulations, for example, to see what you can do? I have an easy answer to that, Brian, and it's not what might one might think. In our in our uh, gallery, we have a couple of panels that are dedicated to owls on stamps, and we call it the Stamps Come Alive program. I love owls on stamps, and so That's people come in and children come in. And our dedicated education director, Henry Lucas, he puts on programs, and the programs are called Stamps Come Alive, Owls on Stamps, Children Are Invited In. They see the Owls on Stamps panel on the wall, and the husband and wife team come in with eight different species of owls. And the owls do their flapping around, the children are able to see them. And so the answer is, that's my favorite exhibit, the <laughs> owls with the owls on stamps present in the building. That is a great answer, and we hope that's going to come up sometime soon again. But the answer to your question on, on opening back up again, I, I think I will answer for you and just nod your head or disagree with me. It will be opened in accordance with the safety rules of the, of the state of Massachusetts as it goes forward, right? But people can, I want to emphasize again, you can make a, a reservation to go and visit there, right? They can make reservations to come for either an appraisal or a donation, and certainly uh, for uh, individuals who are interested, yes, we would be happy to uh, have them come in for uh, a, a, a tour. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, we can go ahead uh, and uh, have groups come in at four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or 10, up to that 10. Really uh, up to, right now right now without violating the protocols. In addition, we're going to be having an open house in advance of our, of our uh, open to the public on Saturday, uh, June the 19th from one to 3 p.m. And we'll be advertising about that. And we would love to have visitors come out. We're gonna have a tent in our back, uh, in the back of our museum with guided tours taking place uh, during that afternoon. So that's kind of the precursor that June 19th. And we're really aiming for maybe July 4th, early July to get the public in, in general. That is, that is great. That, that, that is optimism right there. Are there volunteers available at the opportunities available at the Spelman? Do you accept volunteers? There are, there are. We have a very dedicated uh, Nancy Meyer, our, our curator, mm -hmm. uh, runs our volunteer program. And uh, we really, uh, we, we like our volunteers two ways, Brian. First is with stamp knowledge and without. That is so great. If they want to come in and uh, contribute and in some way, if they have stamp knowledge, then Nancy goes ahead and marries them to the uh, to the area that they're interested in. If not, if not, there are other areas that we can use volunteers as well. We have so many questions we're not going to get to. Can I ask a question for myself for the one without stamp knowledge? You Just can. Me, Jenny, and you've got about 30 seconds to answer because we are coming to the end of this fascinating program. It's excited me and, and I'm from that, that outside group. Tell me why everybody knows, even if they know nothing about stamps, why do they know about the Penny Black? You mentioned it a few times. Just give me the general history of the Penny Black and why it's so fascinating to people, even who are outside of the, the world of stamp collecting. Well, as two Irishmen, we have to give tribute to the 
British postal system, Brian. And it all goes back to a, a remarkable man named Roland Hill. And he I had the idea in 1840 that instead of having these stamps that are all over the place and valued uh, with, with no consistent value, that a stamp should be created with gum on the back and a, a, a design on the front should be made inexpensive and that is how the British deserve credit for creating the penny black. It is the first stamp ever issued for public postage. And the British were the first to do that with their postal system, followed by Brazil, followed by France, the United States in 1847. And I wanna just take the advantage to quickly, these are the first two stamps, Brian, from the United States. We were seven, this is uh, George Washington and Ben Franklin for those who know. What, what, what date again you're talking about there? 1847. 1847. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so there, that's that's the, the background of that. And the other item I need to mention is that we do an annual symposium on postal history. This will be on September the 9th. And we, this year it's going to be on the innovations in war and their effect on postal history. So you'll be hearing a lot more about that symposium as well. But it Absolutely. all gets back to the penny black. God it all gets back to there's a historical position there and everybody knows about it, but can learn far more about it by visiting that museum online or in person. The Spelman Museum has certainly got on my bucket list, uh, Joseph, it wouldn't have if we hadn't had this conversation today. Fascinated by the subject, I'm fascinated by the fact that we had so many people joining us today and fascinated by the history and the social context of many aspects of your work there. Congratulations to you, all the volunteers to Regis Thank College you. for hosting it. Look forward to being there. I'll be first in line uh, coming to visit you, especially on the day when the owls are there and particularly looking forward to bringing my grandchild to that. And again, thanks so much for joining us. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, it's been great to have you with us. Stamps for champs, Brian. Pleasure is mine as well. Thanks Don't be a stranger chance. and come and visit. We will, speaking of stamps being for champs, we're going to go back to another champ uh, for GBH. Her name is Sandy Chin. And uh, Sandy, wasn't that, wasn't that fascinating? That was so fascinating. I know I have a to-do list, um, especially it's it's really in my backyards as for many people at home too. So certainly mm -hmm. on my list this summer, absolutely. Really and, wonderful, Sandy. Great to have you with us. And thanks for all your work behind the scenes of this. Yes. Thank you, and thank you to everyone at home. Financial support from our donors makes opportunities for gathering and connection like today very much possible. And we're here for you as you've been here for us. And we hope that we can count on you again. With a $5 a month sustaining gift of support to GBH or $60 all at once, we'll send you right away this generous size GBH umbrella. It's heavy duty, reliable, and a perfect companion when confronted with the wind and rain this spring season. Just go ahead and click in the chat link to be brought to our secure site or text GBH to 800-492-1111 to make a donation. And if you're already a GBH member, thank you so much for your ongoing support. Now more than ever, our, your commitment really makes all the difference and support from all members in our community keeps us strong and helps us deliver great programs and events just like today. Thanks again. And here's Brian with final words. So again, texting GBH or calling us at 800 or texting to 800-492-1111 using keyword GBH to make that donation. Those donations are important. As you know, we're non-commercial broadcasting, much more than broadcasting radio, of course, where I broadcast each Saturday afternoon on the Celtic Sojourn, television, the news, online increasingly, Passport, if you watch Masterpiece Theater, it's amazing what, what PBS does, what GBH does, and it's all, of course, on the honor system. Uh, we don't charge for it, but we ask you to make a donation to keep it free, to keep it open, and to keep it uh, very, very diverse in its offerings like this one on stamp collecting. Uh, Joseph, again, thank you so much uh, for being with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, great pleasure, Brian. Good luck to you. And I'll turn into your program as well to catch up. Please do. Uh, we might do, a, 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 I'm wondering if there are any songs about the Postal Service of Stamps. I'm sure there are. The mm -hmm. Irish have to sing about everything. They do. Everything. <laughs> and we'll be knocking on your door at the Spellman at Regis College. More information just by, you know, without even taking down a website. Uh, you can just search Spellman and Museum and Stamps. It'll pop right at you. 
exactly. fascinating discussion. Thank you, Kamala. Lots of other events out there as well, wgbh.org slash events. We have 79 questions that we haven't gotten to. That's 79 people that are waiting to ask you those questions. So prepare for a flood of, uh, of uh, inquiries coming to you by email, Joseph. That's a, a tribute to the amazing audience that we have here. And uh, lots of other events happening, wgbh.org slash events. At this time when we're separated, aren't we lucky that we can gather uh, for explorations like this on wgbh.org slash events. Thanks to Bailey, thanks to Eliana, and thanks to Sandy and everybody behind the scenes here at GBH. I'm Brian O'Donovan. Goodbye and good luck. Goodbye. Thanks much.